You are listening to the One Day at a Time Recovery Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hey friend, welcome to the podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Today, I'll be joined by Barb Nangle, who is going to give an absolute masterclass on how to recover with co-occurring addictions. We're gonna talk about OA, ACA, CODA, and go over some of the practices for setting boundaries, building self-worth, and finding your true identity. I'll just note that Barb does more for her self-care than probably anyone I've ever met. I'm not even kidding, she is incredible. So if you're new to recovery, it might sound a little overwhelming, but just know that you don't have to do everything that we talk about to start feeling better right away. Listen for the practices that pique your interest and just follow your intuition. But before we jump in, I just want to give you a heads up about some upcoming changes to the podcast. After seven years, almost eight years of the same format, I'm going to be experimenting with some solo episodes focusing on some of the basics for those who are just starting their recovery journey. I'll still continue to interview guests, so this will be more of an addition than anything else. Also, I would really like to hear from you, the listeners, my friends. After all, there are about 20,000 of you who listen weekly from all over the world, so I want to hear from you. What do you want to hear more of? Maybe more practical tips for early sobriety, different kinds of therapy, or would you like to hear more about how to have better relationships, overcome financial insecurity, or improve your fitness, or be more present in your life? Do you want more book recommendations or are there people out there that you think I should interview? Let me know. Follow me on Instagram at Arlena Allen and shoot me a DM with your suggestions. I look forward to hearing from you. So that's it for the announcements. Without further delay, please enjoy this episode with Barb. Me today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to have this conversation. I loved having you on my podcast. And I remember thinking, I wish I went to recovery meetings with her all the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't do a lot of recovery meetings anymore, but that would be fun. We should we need to find one that we can both go to. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, so I I'm you know what I'm really interested to hear from you is I don't talk to a lot of people that do OA. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, all these substance use disorders are generally the same in the sense that the purpose of obsession is distraction, like distracting mm-hmm. from emotional pain and all mm-hmm. that stuff. But there are such nuances between the different programs and I I, I don't think I actually know a single middle-aged woman who doesn't struggle with food issues, <laughs> you know, my, myself included, you know, menopause hit and that's a whole different ball game. Mm-hmm. But um, I would just love to hear sort of your recovery story. Mm-hmm. Like, actually, let me just start with childhood because mm-hmm. I feel like that kind of sets the stage for yeah. everything else. Can you tell me a little bit about your family of origin? Sure. Yeah. So I want to start by saying I've been numbing since I was a baby. I sucked my thumb until I was 10. I did it consciously until I was eight. I don't know what I did between 10 and 13, but I started smoking cigarettes at 13, weed at 14, drinking at 16. And I would say that the switch sort of flipped for me to being a compulsive eater in my early 20s when I quit smoking cigarettes, which I only quit actually for six months. And then I smoked for 20 years and lied about it unless I was in public with people smoking and drinking. And then I would smoke their cigarettes. And so I grew up in a dysfunctional family. My, my main program is actually ACA adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. I didn't know I qualified for it. I'll have tons of questions about that. Yeah. And um, I didn't know that I was traumatized. I mean, I probably knew that I grew up in a dysfunctional families. I'd heard of ACOA, which is the same thing for many years, but I didn't understand what it was, why adult children of alcoholics needed a program. And I hadn't heard the and dysfunctional families part. And it was actually codependency that landed me into recovery. I started in CODA 
Um, I went for a year, but about six weeks in Dakota, I visited a friend who had been in AA for a long time. And I told her about CODA. She was like, oh, let's see if we can find a CODA meeting um, and we'll go. And she couldn't, but she found an ACA meeting. And I was like, I'll go for her because her dad's an alcoholic. And I walked in and they said some things and I was like, oh my God, these are my people. And that program, it's a trauma recovery program where you reparent yourself and you use the 12 steps to recover. And then a year into that, um, I decided to let go of CODA because it just wasn't really a good fit for me. And it turned out that was a higher power moment because one of the women I was doing the steps with an ACA 12 stepped me into OA. And I have been um, this month, actually, God willing, on the 18th, I will be, excuse me, the 20th, I will be abstinent for eight years. I am down over a hundred pounds from my top weight. I've been at my goal weight for six years, February 1st. But my family, my dad was a heavy drinker when I was a kid. I never thought of him as an alcoholic. My mom was the quintessential codependent. When I was a kid, we called her the enabler. That was the big word back then. Um, My older brother, who's a year and a half older than me, was a really like messy, sloppy spittle coming out of his mouth, drunk alcoholic until he was 24 when he got into a drunk driving accident and then went into rehab. Um, My younger brother, who's eight years younger than me, was had a psychotic break at the age of 20 and um, turned out ultimately they realized that he was bipolar with psychotic tendencies. He also had a substance use problem. His drug of choice was marijuana, which I was like, well, you can abuse marijuana. Like, I never understood that. He died at the age of 35 from Legionnaire's mm-hmm. disease, which um, mm-hmm. he tended to be on the depressive end of the bipolar disorder. He didn't really want to live anyway. And so he had a couple of mm, kind of attempts to commit suicide before that. So um, that was really rough. When he died, I became undone. It was so I was um, 42. And for the for two and a half years, I didn't even wear makeup because I just cried all the time. Mm. And it was really rough for me. I had luckily right before he died, I'd been diagnosed with episodic depression and was under the care of a psychiatrist on medication. And thank God, because then I got more medication and that, you know, really helped me to be under that kind of care. Um, I started therapy when I was probably 15 and um, I was 52 when I got into recovery and I did I went, so that's 37 years of therapy. I didn't necessarily go continuously, but damn close. And um, I read a gajillion self-help books, did workshops, workbooks, retreats, spiritual things, support, like you name it. And the way I think of all that stuff, Arlena, is that it scratched the surface of the iceberg of my life and recovery melted the iceberg of my life. Um. I think the the main thing that happened to me in my childhood is that I was emotionally invalidated. And when I got into ACA, I kept hearing people talk about trauma. And I had the idea that trauma was like what people call big T trauma, that like blunt trauma of, you know, you were in a hurricane or a war or you were raped or, you know, got the shit beat out of you or something like that. And of course that is traumatizing. And when I was 17, Um, two times my senior year, I moved out because my dad tried to strangle me. And I knew that that was traumatic. But I also was like, well, you know, I was almost fully formed. So like, you know, that's not like I wasn't a child when that happened. But about six months into ACA, I started to pick up that the absence of good things happening can result in trauma. And I was like, oh, so I stopped like making excuses for why I was there because I knew I had the traits. So in ACA, they have a list of 14 traits of an adult child, which is affectionately called the laundry list. And I knew that I had the traits. Ironically, when I first heard it in that first meeting, I thought I had seven traits. It turns out I have 13 of them because denial is so rampant in dysfunctional families. And I knew I had the traits, but it was clear that objectively, I did not have it as bad as many people in the room. So it was like, I was like, you know, I don't know if I really belong here. And then I was like, oh, the absence of good things happening. Another way that I've heard that stated is that trauma can result from unmet needs. And so what happened for me was I call it like the drip, drip, drip of emotional invalidation. 
And so all of those numbing behaviors I was doing, like when I was in high school, I was a fucking pothead and I thought I was cool. I thought, you know, that was what was going on. I look back now, I'm like, oh, I was traumatized and I was trying to regulate my nervous system is what was going on. You know, and then, you know, I mentioned in my early 20s, the switch flipped and I became a compulsive overeater and I, but I didn't even know that was a thing. And so I battled with 35 pounds on and off in my 20s. And then in my 30s, it was like 80 to 100 pounds. I don't know the top weight that I got to. Um, The top weight I ever saw on the scale was 247. I know that I weighed more than that, but I don't know if it was like 30 pounds more, 50 pounds more. Um, But I couldn't look at the scale. I I just couldn't. And so at that point, um, the reason I looked at the scale is because I started working with a nutritionist. Nutritionists are not really helpful with compulsive overeaters if they don't understand the disease. Okay. And so my goal weight, I decided when I got into OA and I actually had a healthcare practitioner give me a range and I decided to pick 147 as my goal weight because I knew that means I'm at least 100 pounds down from my weight. And I just can't say how much my life has been improved by the 12 steps of recovery. And one of the reasons I started my podcast is like I said, recovery melted the iceberg of my life. There is so much wisdom in recovery that is just not making its way out into the world. Mm -hmm. And I want that to change because when I got in recovery, I found out so many things about myself that never came to light in all of those therapists and all of that self-help work. So I didn't know I didn't have boundaries. I didn't know that I had victim mentality. I didn't know that I lied all the time. I really thought I was an honest person. I didn't know I had a substance abuse problem. I did sometimes wonder if I was an alcoholic, but I just sort of stopped drinking in my early 40s. So clearly not an alcoholic or I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, I didn't know that I blamed everybody else for everything all the time. I didn't know that I didn't know how to be accepting. I didn't know that I was from a dysfunctional family. I didn't know how many things I was doing to like metaphorically lob bombs into my life and into my relationships. I truly believed that all my partners were at fault. I mean, one thing, the one thing I did know was that I had a long string, maybe even we'll call it a rope of dysfunctional relationships And the farthest I could go to owning anything was like, I'm the common denominator. That was it. And I thought, oh, I, I attract emotionally unavailable men. Well, the real pattern was codependence. It's true that they were emotionally unavailable. But one of the things I learned in recovery was guess why? Because I was emotionally unavailable. No emotionally available man is going to be attracted to an emotionally available woman, at least, you know, for heterosexual relationships anyway. So, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question about my childhood, but I could go on. I'll stop so that you can. No, we're, I'm going to have you go on because that's amazing. I mean, you said so much in there. The last thing you said about emotionally unavailable men, um, that was the reason I dated married men when I was in my 20s. I was okay. a terrible person. Yeah. And I used to always play victim. And what I didn't realize until I got sober is that I was setting my, like, I was the one who was emotional. Like, I was choosing them. And mm-hmm. I didn't even see it. I didn't even see mm-hmm. it until I got mm-hmm. sober. Right. But um, it all kind of stemmed from this feeling of not feeling good enough. And I relate to your story in so many ways about the, you know, my story was around emotional neglect. Mm-hmm. And there was some things that were abusive. Yeah. I neglect, I guess, as a form of, mm-hmm. of abuse. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's one yeah. of the worst forms, actually. Yeah. You know, I had always had a roof over my head and food, mm-hmm. there was food mm-hmm. on the table. Yeah, and me too. I, yeah. But this abandoned emotional abandonment led me mm-hmm. to also abandoning myself. Of course. Yeah. yeah That's so. the legacy of adult children is the thing we fear the most abandonment is the thing we do to ourselves. And that's why in ACA, the solution is to become your own loving parent. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get yeah. into ACA. I've yeah. I've had a uh, Andrea Ashley from the yeah podcast from Adult yes, Child. Yes, she's, that's my favorite her. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm sorry. It is. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's but yeah, I don't um, lie anymore, Arlena. <laughs> with that, I would have people pleased you and lied in the past, but then you wouldn't be having Ooh, me on your show if I would. Look but, at you yeah. all recovered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
You know what's funny though about ACA is I never got, I never knew that there was a slash dysfunctional family, mm -hmm. right? And I was always like, oh, adult children of alcoholics sounds like a great program for you mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that it was a, it also mm -hmm. included dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because I didn't know that it, we had a dysfunctional family. Like I just figured like that was normal for me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I didn't mm -hmm. recognize it as dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think as a kid, I definitely didn't. But as an adult, if you had asked me, did you come from a dysfunctional family? I probably would have said Yes. But it's not like I walked around identifying as the child of a dysfunctional family. And like I said, you know, the first meeting I, when I was in the room, I heard adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was pretty eye opening. Mm -hmm. So when you, I, I would love to learn a little bit more about ACA as well. Mm -hmm. I know that there is that, is it true that there's a yellow workbook? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so have you gone yeah. through that? Yes, yeah, several times. And I've done, I've led um, 20 week step studies a few times and I have sponsees that I've taken through it. So the, the, the fellowship text is affectionately called the big red book. Um, it's yeah. the title is adult children of alcoholics and chapter seven in that book is the 12 steps. So the yellow 12 step workbook in ACA is basically excerpted from chapter oh. seven in the big red book. It's just okay. expanded a bit to have room for writing and stuff. Okay. Um, and then also the newest piece of literature, which is almost three years old now, is called the Loving Parent Guidebook, which is phenomenal. Oh. Um, so reparenting this is how you become your own loving parent it can be as simple as you're just kind and good to yourself. And it, be, it can be as complex as um, you create this whole cast of inner characters, your inner loving, your inner child, your inner teenager, inner loving parent, inner critical parent. And you like work with these. It's, it's based on uh, internal family systems theory. I'm not I'm sure if you're going to say. Yeah. yeah. If you're familiar with that, it's a lot um, like internal family systems theory. It's not like inner child, inner teenager, inner critical parent. It's like, you know, firefighter, protector, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's the same, you know, idea that, that we have parts and and that we can work with them. And I dabbled in reparenting myself for my first almost eight years in ACA. And last year, I just had a game changing year where I really... Like I was aware that I had an inner child, but I wouldn't say I had a relationship with her. And at the time, for the first number of years, the only way I knew to connect with her was one, to look at a picture of me when I was little. I can't recommend that enough. Like get a picture of yourself when you were really little and look at it regularly and connect to her. And then I would do non-dominant handwriting. So the way you do that is you write to yourself with your dominant hand as the adult, and then you use your non-dominant hand to respond. And there's something that happens whereby it bypasses the adult and you're able to tap into your inner child. And I heard this woman actually on the Adult Child Podcast. Her name was Susan Anderson, and I guess she's a trauma recovery expert. And the episode was called The Outer Child. And I was like, I don't know what that is. But she said, if you really want to repair the relationship with your inner child, you need to make consistent conscious contact. So what I only did in the past was wait until something was wrong to try to make contact. So I made a commitment to myself every Monday and Wednesday, Friday night, I was going to make conscious contact. And at the time, again, the only way I knew how to do it was the non-dominant handwriting. And she said, you also need to make small promises to your inner child and you need to keep them. So things like I'm going for a five minute walk, not I'm going to climb Mount Everest, right? Mm -hmm. So little tiny promises. And so I started doing that and go, go figure. I forged a relationship. Like what you want to, you want to forge a relationship with somebody, spend time with them. And so what started happening was I didn't any longer need to be writing to connect with her. And then all of a sudden my inner teenager came online. And then one day this there was this woman, this is all visually in my head. And I feel like for 90% of it, I'm watching it. I'm observing it. I'm not orchestrating, but I can make things happen. Um, and this woman appeared and I just sort of knew that she was my inner critical parent. And that notion of an inner critical parent never resonated with me in ACA. I like in OA and I know in other programs, we say, I have a disease. The disease wants me dead. 
it will settle for me miserable, right? And my disease tells me stuff. So that always resonated with me. So my inner critical voice, I was like, oh, that's my disease talking. But when this one popped up, I was like, oh, that's my inner critical parent. And then over time, I just sort of figured out her name is Irene. I don't know why I know that. And eventually I started actually reparenting her. So there's a few things that I said to her that really changed things. One was, I'm like, thank you so much for being here and for trying to protect me. I know that's what you're doing. You're not alone anymore because I'm an adult now and I have this inner loving parent. And then I have these other like celestial beings and angels and stuff. And she literally was like, oh. now she forgets all the time that she's not alone. So she's still like on the job, but not as bad as she used to be. I also said to her, I know that your goal is to protect my inner children. Do you know that you're scaring the shit out of them? And she was like, oh my God, no, I didn't. You know, so that's been really helpful. And then I also said to her, like, what would you be doing if you weren't like catastrophizing and planning for Armageddon all the time? And she goes, bonsai trees. I've always been interested in bonsai trees. Now, I don't know where this came from. I don't give a shit about bonsai trees. And the next few times when I would make contact with my inner family, she's over in the corner looking at a magazine going, fascinating. These bonsai trees are fascinating. Like, I don't know what that is. And I know there's probably people listening who think, who is this crazy woman that you have on your podcast, Arlena? <laughs> but here's the thing. It is healing me in a deep and profound way that I didn't know was possible, especially after the amazing healing that I got even like my first two to three years in recovery was just astronomical in terms of the changes. And this past year has been incredible. I mean, it's been hard too. And I'm actually going through a really hard time right now too, but I have so many tools that I never had that I got in recovery. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the tools, but I have a quick question for you around and this might seem kind of meta, but, um, but I kind of want to dig into the healing. Like, how do you know that you're healing? Because in my mind, the purpose of any kind of therapy or tool or anything, it's either to feel better or to change behavior. And usually both, to be honest, mm -hmm, usually. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when you say that you experience this deep healing, like what mm -hmm. is, what does that really mean? Like, did you not react to crazy situations? How do you, how do you know? All, all of that, all of that. So yeah. I want to start by saying in ACA, we are powerless over the effects of growing up in an alcoholic or dysfunctional family. Well, the primary effects are fear and distorted mm -hmm. thinking. Wow. Right. Okay. okay. So massive reduction in fear. And okay. I remember like all of a sudden having new thoughts and I was like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? I've never thought anything like that in my life. So it was like, there's some recovery. My okay. first epiphany in recovery for six months, I don't know how far into that on the highway in a traffic jam on the way to work and the traffic is crawling. And for the third time I pumped on the brakes and this thought came in my head, I need to leave more space between cars. And I was like, I've never had a thought like that. I'm like, oh my God, I need to leave more space. And I'm like, oh my God, it's my program. It's working. Holy shit. It's me. I'm the problem. Oh my God, I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. <laughs> so I get to work. I sit in the parking lot for 10 minutes because this just cascade of understanding, like I'm the fucking problem. And I'm not saying that in a self-deprecating way. I'm saying that in an empowering way, because if I'm the problem, then I can be the solution. And I literally drove completely differently after that. So I saw that I had this belief that there should not be traffic on the highway, or at least not when I'm driving. Now, meanwhile, Arlena, the highways were built for traffic. So I was fighting against what is. I was unaccepting yeah. of the fact that there was traffic. And so what I realized was I'm trying to fight against reality. So what I started saying to myself was, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. I remember, you know, the saying from the AA big book, acceptance is the answer to my problem today. I didn't mm -hmm. know what that meant, but I'd been around long enough to know these people know what they're talking about. Right. 
So when I got into a situation where I was very clear, I am not accepting. I just started saying acceptance is the answer to my problem today. Acceptance is the answer to my problem. I just kept saying it over and over again. And my tension went down and I was like, whoa, wait, the situation hasn't changed, but what's happening internally has changed. So it's clearly my thinking that is the problem. So thinking differently was a very clear marker. Um, One of the most incredible benefits of my recovery was learning to build healthy boundaries because my core wound is codependence and the antidote to codependence is learning how to build healthy boundaries. In ACA, the promise number one of that program is we will learn to discover our real identities. I think it should be discover slash create because discover makes it sound like it's just going to be dusted off and we'll figure it out. But when you grow up in dysfunction, there are parts of your personality that don't ever get to be fully formed because you have to morph yourself to adapt to the dysfunction. And I think for me, the way that I discovered my real identity was learning to build healthy boundaries. I started to figure out what are my limits? What do I like and not like? Because I was such a fucking people pleaser. There were some things, of course, I knew that I liked. But like, here's an example of my people pleasing ways. And when I started drinking, I drank beer because it was cheap and it was effective. Uh, Then in my 20s, I dated a guy who was a wine connoisseur. So I drank wine. And then I dated a guy who drank Jack Daniels. So I drank Jack and Diet Coke. And then I dated a guy who was a beer connoisseur. And I learned I actually like Belgian beer. Right. So I couldn't even develop my own freaking drink. Right. So there was a lot of me that was up for negotiation. So building healthy boundaries does so many things. It's like you carve away the pieces that are not authentically you. You get to know yourself. I did not trust myself. I also, I want to say, like, I have always had high self-esteem. I felt like I liked myself. What I learned in recovery was that I did not have self-worth and that I didn't love myself. Because when you look at my behavior whether it was the substance use, the toxic situations, relationships, all the times I put myself in harm's way, that is not the behavior of a woman who feels worthy. That is not the behavior of a woman who loves herself. And when I look at it, it was really the process of building healthy boundaries that got me to trust myself and got me to love myself. Because it's an experimental process. And I learned to build healthy boundaries through this meandering haphazard process in my first like two to three years. I will tell you my food program helped me a lot because a food plan is a boundary. And I had to learn how to talk to people about my food and my recovery in a way that worked for me. So I identify as an abstinent compulsive overeater and sugar addict. So in the beginning, I would say to people, I don't eat sugar. Well, then I need to be their research project. Well, do you eat fruit? What about this? What about that? So then I would say, I don't eat sweets. And it's like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I finally got landed on, I have food issues because so many people have food issues of all kinds nowadays. Literally nobody ever asks, what are your food issues? So, and then I also needed to learn how to refuse people because people like to push food you know, and just say, no, thank you, you know, or I'm going to bring, I bring my own food a lot of places and I don't care what other people think. In the beginning, it was weird and awkward. I learned, I can't do a buffet. I started trying like, okay, I'm only going to have one trip to the buffet. And then it was like, okay, I'm only going to have three different things. And I finally realized like, I can't do a buffet. What I do, if I'm like at a potluck, I will bring something to the potluck that I will take a portion out for myself and I will put my potluck dish on the table and I will only eat that. But I don't go to buffets because it, I, to me, I just want to eat all of it. I don't, you know, but I, I need to protect myself from that stuff. And if people can't understand that, that's okay with me. And I think, you know, that's a really like one of the, the number one question I get from people about boundaries is how do I get rid of the guilt and shame? And it's really about getting clear on what's important to you, what matters to you. So I have all my clients start with what are your top five values? Because if my health and my recovery is my value and I set a boundary with you and say, I'm not going to go to a brunch buffet on Sunday with you and you judge me, I can live with that because I know that I'm doing what matters to me. Yeah. And so I'm not going to feel guilty or shameful. And it doesn't, you don't snap into no guilt and shame, 
But what working towards what matters to you does is it brings you back into integrity with yourself. I know I was all concerned about my integrity with other people. Mind you, I was lying to people all the time. Um, But I was so concerned about being a woman of my word. I never even considered my own integrity with myself. I was so concerned about not hurting other people's feelings. Meanwhile, I didn't give a shit about my own feelings. And so the process of building healthy boundaries gave me all of these gifts, which is why I ultimately became a boundaries coach, because they permeate every area of your life. They were such a game changer for me. And because they permeate every area of your life, I can coach people on just about anything. It tends to be uh, relationships with other humans, whether it's in the workplace, romantically. I work with a lot of women who are enabling either a spouse a partner or an adult child who has mental health and or substance use disorders. Um, But also people with lots of workplace issues, you know, like they've had difficulty in the workplace for a long time. I've worked with a number of very high powered women who are the only woman in a male dominated field. So they feel like they have to represent all of womanhood Mm -hmm. and they go into the bathroom and cry or they go home and cry all the time because it's so fucking hard for them. Yeah. And I'm on a mission to get women to start saying yes to themselves more. You know, yeah. I really, cause I didn't know that saying no was an option to a lot of things. I didn't know. I didn't know so many things were options in my life. So I feel like I went off on a little bit of a tangent no, 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 there. Good. So yeah, you're good. I am going to circle you back to a couple things, but I, mm-hmm. for me, it wasn't always just saying no, but like how to say no. Or what parts to say no to, you know, just having the language, like wanting to be considerate and polite and, Mm -hmm. you know, honesty Mm -hmm. without compassion is cruelty. I was pretty clear on that. Yeah. So, you know, say what you mean, mean what you say and don't say it mean. Yes. And I was like, okay, but what do I actually say? You know, like sometimes it can be so confusing. So it's nice to have somebody in your orbit that you Mm -hmm. can bounce things off of. And it's like, how do, how do I say it? But you know, something you said earlier struck me about the worthiness issue. And it's so interesting because I teach a whole self-esteem class. And the primary idea behind the class is that we only allow into our lives what we believe we deserve on that subconscious level. So my work mm-hmm. is all about changing the subconscious belief system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and then Jamie Kern Lima, she wrote that book, Worthy. I think you're really going to like it, but she's that gal who sold it cosmetics for $1.2 billion. No shit. Wow. Yeah. So she's always toted as the gal who sold a billion dollar company. And I'm like, why are we leaving off the point two? Cause that's 200 million. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even if she just sold it for 200 million, that'd be a big yeah, deal. Yeah. She just came out with this book called worthy. And it was just a slightly different perspective that you actually called out. You said I had mm. high self-esteem, but I didn't have self-worth. And so mm. I've been kind of on this mission to understand what are your thoughts or do you have strategies, practical steps that people can actually do to start mm. building their sense of self-worth? Yeah. I mean, I, I really think for me that it was the boundary building process. And I wish I knew that because it was on reflection that I understood how did I know when and where to set boundaries? It was by what was important to me, which is okay. why I have my clients all start with the values. And, and I say five, cause it's a, it's a decent number that it's meaningful, but it's not so big. You can't like hold on to it. Yeah. So I started showing up for myself. That's what boundary building is. And I think I started building boundaries with the three other women I was in a step group with in ACA And it was probably a couple years before I understood the value of having those women on my side Mm -hmm. because they helped me say things like, keep your hands away from the keyboard and um, reaffirming me and um, saying, you know, you deserve to set this boundary. You are not a bad person for doing this. Like the, the place that I remember very specifically setting boundaries was with an ex boyfriend. So I had broken up with him. He, I was with him for five years, super codependent relationship. And he would email me. So I worked at Yale University full time when I got into recovery. And I'd be at Yale at work. And I'd go into my Gmail personal email for some legitimate reason. And I would see an email from him. Now, mind you, this is my ex-boyfriend. I do not have a relationship with anymore. 
I would see the email and I would feel compelled to open it immediately. I would get super triggered. I'd be really pissed off and I'd write this big, long blah, 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 and send it back to him. And I'd blame him for interrupting my day. And it wasn't until I got into recovery that I understood that I interrupted my day by opening that. I didn't know like that compulsion, that codependent compulsion with an ex-boyfriend via email. There's no way he knows when I'm opening the email. But I was like, oh, he's going to think I'm a bad person if I don't open the email and respond right away. So I got like, oh, I'm going to wait until I have the psychic space to deal with this. And then I started realizing, you know, I can pause before responding. I don't have to write a litany of things. I can be succinct. Like that, this was a process that took months and months and months. And then I eventually realized I can delete it. I don't have to even open it or respond. And then it probably was two years before I realized, oh my God, I can actually block him. Like it just took me this long period of time. He was reaching out to you for two years? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, not not super frequently, but and I even had a conversation with him. Actually, I don't think it was a conversation. I think it was a text message where I said, I wish you all the best. I'm not interested in any kind of relationship. Yeah. And I like I blocked him on email before I blocked him on text because he did email me more frequently. But this was via email. Like he's not even standing in front of me. He wasn't even I wasn't even in a relationship. That is how codependent I was. And so learning, like having the support of other people was so important. And here's why, what I figured out why I think that is people with poor boundaries grow up in families where they are either enmeshed or abandoned or both, which was the case in my family. Right. So when we go to set boundaries, we know it's not enmeshment. And the only other thing we know is abandonment. So we don't want to set boundaries with people because we're afraid we're going to be abandoned. Even if we're the one initiating the boundary, it still feels like abandonment. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have these other, I call them boundary partners now, these other people that are metaphorically and sometimes physically holding your hand, they help you process your difficult feelings because that's the main reason people either don't set boundaries or they cave on them is because of the guilt and the shame. And they help you process your difficult feelings so you don't have to launch them at the target of your boundary. And they affirm you and assure you and say, you know, you're doing the right thing. It's also a good idea, I think, to get your thoughts about what you're going to say and when you're going to say and how you're going to do it when you're setting a really difficult boundary with someone who's not emotionally involved. It's your boundary and you get to do whatever you want. But if you get someone who's not emotionally involved, they could say like, eh, you might not want to do that in person, or you might not want to say it like that. You know, you get to decide for yourself. But when you have these other people supporting you, when you go in to set the boundary, you know, there's somebody who knows where I am, what I'm doing and what I'm going through. And they're on my side and I'm not abandoned. And when you do this more and more, you show up for yourself and you start to feel better about yourself. And the more boundaries you set, the better you feel and the easier it is to set more boundaries. You don't have to wait until you feel good about yourself to set boundaries. There's like this iterative right. process. And eventually you'll have people that are new in your life that only know you with boundaries. And you're like, oh my God, this is what it can be like in a friendship or in a relationship. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. And so it reinforces for you in the existing relationships that you have. Like, it's okay. Like I can have relationships with people that, you know, that I've had in my life before that I set boundaries with. No, I don't, I'm not going to lie. You are going to lose some people. Like I lost people. Yeah. And, and, the way I look at it is they got out of the way so that my actual people can get to me because yeah. like my pattern was chasing people, especially not, not especially romantic friends. Yeah. Most of my friends, I put in 85 to 90% of the work in the relationship. And when I got in recovery and I stopped doing all of the chasing, I hardly ever see any of those people anymore. Yeah. I got no ill will against them, but I'm not working harder than you. I want, I want someone who's going to be in it with me 
And it doesn't have to be 50-50 100% of the time, but it's got to on balance be 50-50. I want to spend time with people who really want to spend time with me, which means they put effort into the relationship. Now, I did do chasing in romantic relationships too, don't get me wrong, but it was more going in my friendships. Yeah, of course. We've been talking a lot about setting boundaries with others, Mm -hmm. but what I have found is that for me, like the hardest boundary to set is with myself. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, I tend to be a little bit of a workaholic, like setting Mm -hmm. boundaries with myself Mm -hmm. in two ways, like expectation of what I'm going to get in return, but Mm -hmm. also in terms of volume of work. Like I have to be very careful Mm -hmm. not to give beyond my level of capacity to where I don't incur resentment, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, but with the working thing, it's so funny. It's like, I'd work like 14 hours a day and just like all this marketing training. And you and I were talking earlier about being entrepreneurs and recovery, which is so hard. It's like, Mm -hmm. you really have to Mm -hmm. work hard on yourself. I learned that I could do things that felt urgent, but they weren't important, like finding busy tasks. And I recently learned a new term, uh, priority dilution, like for the over for the overachievers or the workaholics who have too many things to do, but it's like a way of being productive without actually making progress. Man, I was in that trap for, well, I, I guess I'd be lying if I said I didn't still fall into that. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on how to set boundaries with mm-hmm. yourself? Yeah. So I call these boundaries of self-containment. self-containment. There are things you either either need to contain or stop doing. And these were hands down the most impactful boundaries of my life. Mm-hmm. I had no idea the kinds of things that I was doing that were creating chaos and perhaps exacerbating existing chaos around me. And one of the things as I've done this work, I've realized that some of these boundaries of self-containment really only affect me. They don't affect anybody else. So Mm -hmm. inner critic, for example, as soon as I hear that inner critic, I need to contain that and stop it and change the channel. Um, Make giving away personal and private information to other people and making myself unnecessarily vulnerable. I need to stop doing that shit. Right. So those are examples of boundaries of self-containment that only affect you. What is your process to come out of the inner critic when, once you notice it? Mm, yeah. Well, I did a lot of work in my late twenties to clean up my negative self-talk. And then I got into recovery and I learned that there was way more going on. I feel like it was like subterranean, like below, below subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes at the level of feeling rather than at the level of words. But I think, you know, I don't typically think it, I typically turn it around. So I'll give an example of the feeling. Like I often had this feeling that I needed to like back off, shrink down, be less. And I've had it my entire life. And I was actually, it was a yoga nidra class and the teacher had us do some kind of journaling. And I don't, I wish I knew what question she asked because it got me. She's like, what's the issue? What's the main issue? And I realized that the words to describe that feeling were I'm too much. So what I came up with, with the antidote to that was I'm just the right amount of everything. And it took me a while to get to that. But I think the reason there was no words attached to it, because I got the message before I had language that I was a burden, that I was too much. Right. And so I said to myself on a regular basis, I'm just the right amount of everything every time it happened. And I almost never need to say it anymore because I truly, and like, I will say, listen, you do not have to believe affirmations in the beginning. Just fucking say them because it's better than saying the poisonous crap and the venomous stuff that you're saying to yourself. And so for me, I think of it as changing the channel Um, I also just proactively say affirmations all the time. And so eventually what happens, and I record my own voice on audios and play them for myself every single day. You know who else does that? I heard of Dr. Peter Atia. He's the host of Drive. He talked about, he did trauma therapy where his exercise was to write down what he says to himself. Right, right. And he did the voice recording. Yes. And so I think you need to know what you're saying to yourself so that you can negate it. Yeah. Because I think negating it is really, really important. And I do an enormous amount 
of personal work every day. I make an enormous amount of conscious contact. I meditate, I pray, I say affirmations, I do mindset journaling, I do daily readers. I do the same, you know, a, a lot of that same stuff at the end of the evening. I, I, you know, I eat three meals and two snacks a day. I pray every time I eat. I have a reminder on my phone to pray in the middle of the day. I also have a, a reminder app that just has affirmations that I plugged in that I have an affirmation app because I need to do this. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine what my life would be like if I wasn't doing this stuff all the time. Because like I said, I'm going through some shit right now and it's rough. But I have skills and tools and I do all of these other things to remind myself who I really am, which is I am a beloved child of the universe. Yeah. You know, and I know that, but I forget constantly. And I can't imagine what it would be like if I wasn't making all this conscious contact with my higher power. Tell me a little more about your higher power. How did that come to develop to where you are now? So can we put a pin in that for a second, just so I can close the loop on the, um, other boundary of self-containment. Would you mind? Yeah, yeah. Which, I'll, I'll be yeah, real quick please. about it. Yeah. No, so, take your time. Um, yeah. So the other type of boundaries of self-containment are the kind that don't just affect us. They affect other people as well. Mm-hmm. And gossip is a really good example. I, that Ooh, turned out to yeah. be one of my worst defects of character, which I was shocked to find out that talking about my <laughs> boss negatively behind her back for 19 years was gossip, even though that's like the definition of gossip. And so I'm sure she had a coming. Uh, oh yeah, of course. And so when I started trying to quit gossiping, I was like, oh my God, gossip feels really good. Why does it feel so good? And I started talking to people in recovery and one person said, well, you got to make yourself feel better than other people. And I was like, oh shit. And then someone else said, well, you get to blame other people for your problems. Like ding, 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 ding. Rude. And so when you gossip, you are harming yourself and you're harming other people. So you're not just, you're creating chaos is what you're doing. So yes, you're harming the reputation of the person that you're gossiping about. Yes, you're harming your own reputation by being a gossip. You're contributing to the drama. So what I realized when I got in recovery, I was still working with that same boss. When I stopped gossiping about her, my resentment against her went down by like fucking 80%. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a huge part of the problem. And what I realized was I was focused on problems, not solutions. So my issue with her was that she was super unreliable in so many ways. So none of us ever went to her and said, you know, this isn't really working. We need to have a conversation about how we can change things. And the other thing I did was I was there longer than anybody besides her. And I had a larger purview over our work over than anybody but her. So I created a culture of expectation. We talk about her behind her back. We don't focus oh. on solutions. We focus on problems. Right. And so when new people came in, they joined this culture and this is what we do. We talk about her behind her back and we bitch about her and we commiserate about her. And it's like, I don't need to commiserate for 19 years. So my containing that gossip, um, really, I was astonished at the ripple effect on my team and my organization of just me setting boundaries and stopping gossiping. It was just incredible, the ripple effect. So even if you think everybody else is the problem, you can be a huge part of the solution if you learn how to build healthy boundaries because you're going to have a ripple effect on everybody in your life, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your, you know, your volunteer organizations, you know, siblings, parents, you're going to have an effect in some mm-hmm. way, shape or form. It just, that's just the way that it is. Absolutely. No, thank yeah. you for closing the loop on that. That is yeah. actually really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you want to tell me about your higher power? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to. So um, my higher coaches. powers, <laughs> yes, my higher power is so important to me. My business is called higher power coaching and consulting. So Um, I was baptized Catholic. We stopped going to church when I was six and we never talked about God ever again. My older brother was a staunch atheist and he was like the main thing that I heard. Um, I was agnostic. I was always like, he would be atheist and I was like, eh, eh, something's going on here. But the only models of any kind of religion that I knew were Christians and I saw a bunch of hypocrites, I wasn't exposed to any other kinds of religions until I was an adult. And um, I was fine with being agnostic. I was like, something's going on here besides just the earthly plane. I don't know what it is. And then when I was like 35, 36, I 
through a series of incredible serendipitous events, I read the book Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And I read it over a weekend and I went from being a lifelong agnostic to being a believer, at least in my conception of God. And then very soon, I think it was after that, it could have been before that, within like a month, I was talking with somebody and um, I said to him, I feel the need to do something consistent and positive like church, but without the whole Jesus, God, Bible thing. And what's interesting now, Arlena, is I go to a Christian church and I sort of loosely identify as Christian, which I would have laughed at you years ago if you'd ever told me that would happen. And he said to me, you're a Unitarian Universalist. You just don't know it. So I started going to the Unitarian Fellowship of Stores, which was in Stores, Connecticut, where UConn was. I was a grad student at the time. And um, I got exposed to all different kinds of religions, including some very like uh, women centric um, religions and started seeing like there's something called spirituality, which is divided from the world of religiosity. Yeah. And I was a UU for a few years. Um, I now go to a UCC church, which is United Church of Christ. I identified as a pretty spiritual person after having read Conversations with God, which I read many times and I read it damn close to all the books. I don't know if all of them. And then I got into recovery and my spirituality just magnified. I would say the difference is that I use God in ways I never did before. So I didn't reach out to God. I didn't ask for God for guidance. I didn't ask God to show me. And I say he, I don't mean it. I ask God show, you know, to sh- show me his will for me and give me the power to carry it out. I do. I say that AA third step prayer and seven step prayer um, and a Buddhist prayer every single morning, um, every single afternoon, every single night, and often more frequently than that. Um, I just, I I don't remember what it was, but I remember like the first time when I handed something over to God and it was taken from me, it was like a millisecond, but I had that freedom. Like, Oh my God, I don't have to be in charge of everything forever for the rest of my life. Holy shit. And then I just started doing it. And the way I thought of it was I wasn't handing things over to God. I was shoving them to God. And at first I was like, Oh God keeps handing them back. And I realized, no, actually I'm taking them back (laughs) is what's happening. Yeah. And so um, I uh, I asked God for guidance all the time. I wish I asked God for guidance more. You know, I do it multiple times a day, but I wish I could do it like 24 hours a day. But I forget because I'm a human. And sometimes I will get an image. Sometimes I will get a word. Sometimes I will get nothing. Um, but I frequently get something. And I just assume if I keep asking, whatever's happening is what God wants from me. And what I ultimately mean is I think to me, God is the all of everything plus a little bit more. You know how they say like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I sort of think of like God like that. And I'm able to hold on to the seemingly contradictory notion that God is both the all of everything. So something that I am part of and something that is separate from me to which I can pray. And in this earthly plane, that doesn't make sense. I don't give a shit. It makes sense to me, you know? Um, So that's what I would say about my higher power. No, that's beautiful. I feel like there's a, you know, um, certain things that are just like God-sized jobs, Mm. right? And that's, you know, for me, it's like at the end of the day, God is love. And there are certain things that are just God-sized jobs. And I was kind of mm-hmm. raised with the, God's not going to do for you what you could do for yourself. So I was like, oh, I guess I have to do everything. Um, so it's, I, girl, I'm with you. Like, yeah, I keep handing, you know, shoving things over, but quickly take it back, you know, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. oftentimes I just don't know what else to do. But I've just, you mm-hmm. know, really come to this place of surrender. It's like, there are just some things that, mm-hmm. that are that are outside of my ability to um, affect change on, whether it's my ability to uh, practice self-containment. Now I have new words. <laughs> that was really good. Um, so yeah. Yeah. But it's, I think it's accepting that once I've asked for help and things continue on, that that's, you know, it's it, everything is as it should be. Sometimes that's a mm-hmm. hard, mm-hmm. hard thing to accept, especially when you're Absolutely. going through a challenge. I'm yeah, going to have to go back absolutely. to the conversations with God. I read, I read it when it first came out 
Mm. That was a long time ago, probably 30 years ago, maybe yeah. 25, I, something like that. I think that. I read it in 98, so that's 24, 26. Yeah, that so I don't know when it came out, though. I don't remember how long it had been out then. So yeah, that, that it was definitely the out. 90s, I think, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, listen, you have downloaded so much really valuable information. Um, I know you have programs, you're a coach, you have programs. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. how do people connect with you? I'm sure that like people that are listening, I'm sure something has resonated, Mm -hmm. you know, um, if people need a little additional support, do you do group coaching one-on-one, both? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a boundaries coach and, um, I have a podcast. My favorite place to hang out on is on, on social media is on Instagram. I'm at higher power coaching. My podcast is called fragmented to whole life lessons from 12 step recovery. They're 10 to 20 minute episodes on pretty narrowly specific topics. And you can go to fragmented to whole.com. Or if you're listening to a podcast, you can just go on your app and look it up. (laughs) Um, I do private coaching and group coaching. I have, um, a monthly membership group that we meet twice a month. That's called the guilt free guild. That's a very light touch program. Yeah. And, um, I would love to work with anybody who's interested in building healthy boundaries. I do group programs only for women. I will work with men one-on-one, but not in groups. But I, I really gear my stuff towards women. I'm essentially looking to help former me is who I'm looking to help, you know, like I looked on the outside, like I had my shit together to the outside world. And meanwhile, I was a mess internally and relationship wise. And, you know, obviously I did a lot of substance use because I needed to, to try to live with myself. And I did an enormous amount of isolating, even though I'm an extrovert, you know, I'm actually an extrovert who needs a lot of alone time. I I think actually I learned that's called an ambivert is what it's called. Oh, I, I always called myself an extroverted introvert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I love, I love me some people, but yeah, yeah. I need to go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for hanging oh, out with me you. today. Thank you. Yeah. So many amazing things. I was, I was, I'm using this new uh, Riverside app to record and it allows for uh, making little clips. So nice. as you were talking, I was like, there's a clip. There's a clip. There's oh, a clip. good, good. Yeah, good, good. so we covered awesome. a lot of ground today. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I love oh, the work Oh, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah me too. Me I so appreciate how much, I, I mean, to me, carrying the message of recovery to those who still suffer is the mission of my life. So Amen. I'm down with anybody who's on that mission with me. So thank you for all that you do. Of course. And we'll talk again real soon. All righty. Thank you so much. Bye, Arlena. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.